This is China Business Cast, your guide to doing business in the wild, wild east. We're here to get detailed and get personal with experienced entrepreneurs making things happen in China. If you want to learn from on-the-ground accounts of how business actually gets done, this is the program for you. Hello and welcome to China Business Cast, Episode Seven. I'm your host JP. Just a short update. So we've settled into a biweekly podcast schedule here. And barring any special circumstances, I'll be releasing new episodes every other week. And one more thing before we get started with today's episode: if you got any feedback or suggestions for the show, please head over to ChinaBusinessCast.com and send me your comments via the form. Okay, with that in mind, let's get down to business. Today's guest, Terry Lin, is the host of Build My Online Store, a podcast that helps e-commerce entrepreneurs grow their businesses. By interviewing successful entrepreneurs, industry experts, and thought leaders, a few months ago, Terry decided to create an e-commerce product himself from scratch. He was able to find a manufacturer in China, get a sample made, and get the first production run done while being remote the entire time. Today, we'll discuss how he decided on the product and the process he went through to source the product from China without ever setting foot in the country. Welcome to the show, Terry. Hey, JP. Thanks for having me here, and everyone,、uh, thanks for tuning in. Cheers. So、uh, I have a very specific goal for today. My specific goal is to understand, you know, this product that you decided to create, and really learn how you manage the entire sourcing process remotely. Because you know, most of the time, people who source products end up, you know, making a couple of trips to China. So I think it's a little bit more tricky to manage the entire process remotely.、Yeah. But you managed to do that. So、sure. uh, we're going to hear from your experience. But before we get into the nitty gritty details. Let's get、um, a little bit of background. Can you give us a bit of background about you, the Build My Online Store podcast, and what led you to creating this product? Sure. So about、uh, a little almost two years ago, I realized that I wasn't really happy in my job. Well, that in the sense that I wasn't really fulfilling, and so I kind of looked into the startup world somehow.、Uh, I guess either through Far Work Week or somewhere along that path, and then. I ended up looking to make money online, and so one thing I did was back in the day is I used to resell college textbooks online. I'd basically buy it from my classmates at twenty dollars, and then I'd sell it on Amazon for like seventy or eighty. This was in kind of like the early two thousands when people were just starting to buy books online, and so that's how I kind of got. Into e-commerce very early on, and after I graduated,、uh, like I said, I got in the job. I kind of got in the corporate world, and I realized that, hey, you know, why don't I revisit my roots and get into e-commerce again? And so this was probably. Early 2012, late 2011, and I realized the world in terms of e-commerce had changed a lot since then.、Uh, basically, e-commerce,、uh, your Amazon, eBay were big portals, and you had these crop of kind of individual e-commerce stores that were getting really easy to start. Got,、uh, platforms like Shopify, Big Commerce, where literally you can get a store started in like a day or two. And so, what I wanted to figure out was that okay, so what's changed in the industry? And so I started emailing, you know, 60, 70, 80 store owners, just cold email saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to get into this business.、Uh, Too. So, what's something you wish you knew starting out, or any advice do you have for me? And so, one of my guests, uh, uh, Ajay, over at Happy Hour Studios,、uh, he kind of we had a back and forth going on, and then after a while, we're、like, hey, let's just hop on Skype and let's just talk about your business, and then. Uh, that was kind of the first episode from there, and after that, I started reaching out to more store owners, just figuring out, you know, what were the mistakes they made,、uh, lessons they learned, and the successes and failures they had, so that a、uh, kind of personally I could learn it myself, and also b、uh, they could share it with someone else, someone they get some extra exposure for the business, and c as a listener, if you're getting into this business, you can also learn from this conversation I have. So it's not just one sided where it's me and him, but it's also shared with the whole world. So、uh, after that,、uh, I realized that、uh, you know there's comes to a point where you can only talk about you know creating a business online so much before you actually have to do it yourself. And so when I realized that, I was like, okay, so what can I do myself that a I could you know really focus on for the next three to five years, kind of in a long ball game, and also、uh, kind of that aligned with what I wanted to do in life and kind of. Uh, something that I could be excited about and also feature as a case study on build my online store because I think there's a lot of synergy where you can show someone building a store versus you know just doing it privately and why not showcase it to show people how to actually do it and you know maybe I'll make mistakes maybe it won't work but I think it'll, there's a lot of value to show people the path kind of like how Pat Flynn does it with his、uh, niche sites but you know I'm just doing it with the e-commerce so kind of rip- pivoting and jamming with his idea. Cool. So yeah, actually I'm a subscriber of Build My Online Store as well. 
We'll definitely link up to that in the show notes. It's a great podcast to check out for those who haven't uh, subscribed to it yet. Okay, so yeah, and you, and you were on uh, episode uh, five, so uh, give yourself yeah, some that's credit right. there too. <laughs> <laughs> episode five, selling condoms online. That's right. One of my online businesses. For the listeners who are interested, we'll link up to that show, yeah. um, that and, episode as well. You know, it's funny when I tell some people about the show and then they look through it, they're like, wow, like, how did you find this guy that sells condoms? They're like, wow, this is so fascinating. So. <laughs> <laughs> Props to you, man. Someone's got to do it. It's a tough job. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. So, so you had the Build My Online Store podcast and you decided that you wanted to get into the e-commerce business yourself and also share the journey. So take us back to the beginning. You had the, that idea. What was the first thing that you did? Sure. So I actually didn't think, like, what am I going to build? I actually went through kind of like a checklist of some products that I wanted to make. Because, you know, if you think about getting into products, you look at like something like the iPhone where there's like thousands of components and companies that are involved in it versus uh, something like a fan, which is, you know, l relatively less complex, but you still need to, a lot of moving parts, you know, like, like motors, whatever goes in a fan. And then the ship shipping a fan, it just doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it's like a pretty cheap product, but you're going to spend so much on shipping because it's so big. And so kind of the checklist I had was that uh, kind of like a seven points. Uh, one, it has to be cheap to prototype and test and ideally under $100. Uh, it had to have good margins. Uh, three, it couldn't be fragile in terms of like, you don't want to be making plates and then you ship it to your customer and it breaks. And so four, it also has to be easy to ship and inventory. Five, no assembly required. Six, uh, I wanted the value inherently to be ambiguous in the terms that uh, there was a big potential for branding to it. So if you look at like, say Nike or Google, inherently those words don't really mean anything, right? It's after the brand is there that it actually is what it is. Whereas kind of if you say plate, you know, a plate is just the plate, but uh, there's kind of the difference there. And so I wanted to take advantage of something that could have some branding built into it just in the long term, because I think if you're selling commodity products, uh, you know, with, uh, was it the universal tag code on Amazon? I mean, you're just going to get beat on price. And I think price isn't a very long term strategy you want to build a business on and ultimately your life on too. And so uh, the last point, low turnover to newer product models. So but going back to the iPhone example, uh, the iPhone, you know, technology products, every couple of years, you have a refresh cycle, right? So kind of wanted something that would be timeless in the sense that I wouldn't need to always, you know, be like the fashion industry, release a new product every season or like a new bag every couple months. So that's some, those, those are the kind of like the seven points that I wanted to have when I looked into products. And then that's how I landed into the accessories market. And so the other side of this checklist was that, okay, what, what something that I can do that I could be excited about. And so I think we're both part of the same mastermind, Dynamite Circle. You know, we've traveled a lot. Uh, we enjoy seeing the world. And so kind of that's what I wanted to combine with this business just on a personal level. Level and a professional professional level because uh, I think you know the product wise accessories other wallets you know it may, it fulfills all the checklist and then kind of on the personal side it's something that aligns with what I want to do in life too so uh, that's kind of the two tracks I decided to merge uh, together with this product cool okay so actually that checklist is you know pretty solid in terms of e-commerce products to pursue so you had this idea for this product what was the sort of initial step you took to make sure that there was a demand for it? Sure. So first thing I did was to make sure that A, are people actually selling this, right? So you go to Amazon, eBay, and you just type in passport wallet, passport uh, holder, travel wallet, because the exact keyword for this term is kind of ambiguous. Like even trying to figure out like right now, it's like, I'm not really sure if to call it a travel wallet or a passport wallet, because it's kind of the same thing. But you know, you know, when you do the searches, search SEO stuff, like the keyword research, it, it kind of varies uh, from keyword to keyword. And so, but I think the overall thing is that, okay, are people buying this? And then A, was their feedback on Amazon? So one thing I did was you go to Amazon and you look at like the one star reviews and and then you look at the five four-star reviews. So basically, if someone is willing to complain about a one-star review, uh, you know that's a feature in a future product that's important enough that you should try to fix. You should see it as an opportunity to say, hey, you know, maybe I can create something better that resolves this problem. And what you do is you do a bunch of searches on, like, say, five products. You s copy all the reviews into Evernote. And then what I did was I did a uh, pros and con list and I drew a line down the middle and then all the negative feedback, I would write it down. And then whenever it overlapped with the pro uh, where someone was really happy with the same feature, I knew that was something I had to include uh, in the product. Because it kind of verifies that A, you know, someone that has it is happy with it and someone that doesn't have it is unhappy with it. And that kind of, it tells you that, okay, this is something uh, you should include. And so- Can you give a specific yeah. example of that for this particular product? 
Yeah, sure. So my product is uh, basically a travel wallet. It can hold your credit cards, uh, your ID cards, uh, foreign currencies, your passport, you know, train tickets, boarding passes. Because what happens is when you travel a lot, you have all this stuff in the bag and you just can't, you can kind of throw it in your bag, but then it gets lost. And especially if you're running around, you're transiting through two, three countries with all these different currencies, it becomes kind of an inconvenience issue. And so, and so this thing just kind of helps you get everything organized. So uh, one of the feedbacks that I saw was the products that had clips on the middle either like a band because what happens is when you stuff a lot of paperwork you know your passport gets thick uh, sometimes the wallet bulges out and so a lot of people are saying hey i wish this thing had like a button or a band that could close it and some of the other products that had this band they're like oh this is awesome you know it can keep everything in place it has this band that stuff doesn't get around and so i kind of saw that okay this is something i want to include in the future later on and so another thing was that you realize that uh, when people buy luxury items when we're talking like really high-end like a louis vuitton gucci you know no one really wants to carry around this on vacation and it's like a huge red flag that says hey you know i'm a tourist you know i ripped me off i have too much money and so when i realized okay people are probably looking for something that's nice but not necessarily super super brand like you don't want to carry around a you know 500 hundred dollar leather wallet you know to like bali or you know like vietnam where it's stuff you know your safety i mean not that it's not safe but compared to like say usa like a first class city you know there's a different risk factor right so so i think that was kind of a underlying concern but it wasn't as critical because if you look at the feedback you'll see a lot of overlap and so basically you just tally whenever you hear the same feedback you just tally it one two three four five and then over like you know 200 maybe maybe just like 50 to 100 units of feedback you can see what's really standing out from the both pros and con list and then you can use that to work off of a product design so if we go into product design a little bit more um it's really hard to talk to a supplier just like how we are now about what you want like if i just say hey you know jp i want to make a leather bag that's brown but what kind of brown like how shade of a brown do you want you know how dark do you want it what kind of grain do you want do you know like top leather grain full leather grain you know suede or whatever right so what i did was i went to pinterest and then i basically searched a passport holder travel wallet and then whatever i liked i would just save it onto my computer and then use a tool called snagit you can draw like circles you can point arrows on it and then you just save it and then after you get like a couple designs you narrow them down to like three or four and then you send them to a supplier and say hey this is the different parts i like on this wallet so say say something more complicated like a laptop bag you can say hey i like the handle on this bag i like the zipper on this other bag i like the pouch on this third bag and then just try to combine them all together into a sketch and then that's like a basis to work off of now obviously this is different for say like electronics which uh, i don't have experience in but i think for like basic you know products that have pictures somewhere this is a pretty good base to work off of so let's back up a little bit we're yeah. talking about the product design already before you got into that what gave you the confidence to say that a this is something that enough people want that i should pursue it oh okay, sure so one thing I also did was i did some keyword research in terms of the seo friends so i did a quick check on the search demand so uh, basically, the words passport holder had, you know, th I, I assume your audience knows some SEO. So basically, in the exact matches, they came out at like low, th no, high 3000s, almost like 4000 for passport holder. And then the other variants had like mid 2000s or low 2000s. So I knew there was some base kind of off that. And then uh, when I looked at the cost per click for AdWords, there were some people paying, you know, it was between the one and $2 range. So I knew it wasn't too competitive. And then when you look at the market, just to what's on Amazon and kind of the products out there, you, there's definitely room to improve. So I think knowing that there's people buying on Amazon and eBay, A, that kind of helps you verify the idea a little bit and also that uh, they're giving feedback too that you can work off of. So uh, kind of, I don't think there's like a bulletproof way to say, hey, you know, there's demand for this, but you know, it's kind of like a gut check at least uh, to just look on these two platforms to see if there's anything on there. Cool, yeah. So you had the idea, you checked out that there is demand and you had some ideas of how to make a product that was appealing and an improvement to the existing things on the market. How did you go about finding a manufacturer? Sure. So uh, the manufacturer side, I just use uh, Alibaba. And then uh, Alibaba is like kind of like a Amazon, but for suppliers. So basically you just type in what products you want to make and then they'll give you a list of suppliers. And, and obviously you need to do a lot, lot more due diligence than just, you know, 
it's not it's just like a google search right? you're you actually do you need to do a lot of work to find out uh get a sample made get or well, even before that just get your design set up and then communicating back and forth on some changes and before you finally get a prototype and so the point that really hit home for me was that my first sample only cost uh 30 bucks to make so really i mean you, you probably talk about low risk you know you, you spend something uh you spend you know less than 100 bucks on an idea if it doesn't work hey you know it doesn't work and you you, you didn't build the whole site you didn't order thousands of inventory just to realize it didn't sell so that really told me that hey you know i'll just go with this and if it doesn't work uh, you know that's so be it so before you get to the sampling part i mean i've been on alibaba when you type in a search there's like literally hundreds and hundreds of manufacturers that pop up can you take us through the process sure. that you went through to find one that you thought you know was going to be a, a good one sure so one thing you have to realize on alibaba is that you'll usually have uh, some of them are factory direct suppliers. Some of them are trading agents. And so trading agents, uh, from my understanding and yours, is that they're kind of just middlemen who don't really own the factory. They're just like a sales guy who says, hey, you know, you want to get fans made, uh, go through me. I'll get them made for you. But he actually doesn't own the factory. He actually owns, he actually makes his cousin or someone else make it for him. And so what happens is uh, they won't be as transparent. And I think uh, when you're looking for a supplier, you know, are they uh, transparent with who they are? You know, are they pretty open with showing their documentation, like their licenses, their awards, uh, even just giving like customer references, uh, sending samples, you know, all this kind of stuff is like very basic, you know, sourcing stuff. Like they should, people should just be kind of proud of who they are, right? And if they're not, if they're like, you know, even if you call them, you know, they're not willing to talk to you. That's something that's kind of like a red flag, right? And so because every person on Alibaba, or at least the kind of the legit guy should have some salesperson. Uh, within the factory direct that kind of represents their company and you can just kind of tell by their professionalism like you know, even just looking at their email do they have a you know decent signature you know do they have a real business you know google maps uh where their address is you know make sure it's actually like a kind of somewhere in the industrial range and it's not like some some apartment building and i think another thing you can look at is the registered capital so uh, if you look at a registered cap like if they have under a hundred thousand rimming b which is like less than 20k us like you can't really set up a factory with that amount of money and so kind of just through these different channels you can see how legit someone is and i think alibaba also has uh, i think like the on-site verification gold suppliers but i think uh, two years ago there was a scandal where i think some of the gold suppliers were basically just scamming people uh in complicit with alibaba and so uh, those are only like two percent of the gold suppliers but i think just having those basic filters does help out a little bit and so uh, in the end, you still have to do your due diligence and kind of it is a gut feeling thing in the end. Like, cause you know, you can only do so much checking before you actually have to pull the trigger. So how many suppliers or manufacturers did you look at based on your search and did a deep dive into and how many did you, you know, engage with? Sure. Initial list was about seven to eight. And then I narrowed it down quickly to three to four, just based on the products they had, because I didn't want like your generic Walmart wallet that was like, you know, with the poly leather with vinyl in it. It was like, a, it's like really cheap leather. And I didn't want to just make like a product like that and so basically just looking at the pictures you could take those guys out and then after that uh, becomes a looking at okay how are these guys communicating you know who's more professional uh, are they pretty responsive and do their products actually look like something i want to make because every person on alibaba they post products of what they have or kind of existing product lines that are available for uh, reference and so uh, really it came down to two in the end and then the last one i went to was just because they gave me some more information on where the designers came from so i was like hey you know who, like i asked them hey what do your customers typically sell uh, your, your products at at the end market and you know where are your best sellers you know where do your designers come from they're all very open with uh, this information so that's who i decided to go with so you went through the selection process and you were able to find a manufacturer and after that you initially got a sample going right how were you able to communicate the design of the product i think we touched on this a little bit but can you go into that process a little bit more Sure. So what I did was um, I created a Photoshop file that was like 3000 by 3000 and I just posted different parts of a product. Uh, well, what, what I did was I got a picture of their product, like a stock photo on Alibaba and I put it in the middle in Photoshop. And then what I did was I copied different products on Pinterest or like Google searches that I liked around the product and I would point arrows to different places that I liked on those products and where I wanted them to change it on their existing one. So I didn't have to say, hey, you know, change this pocket here to, you know, 10 centimeters. Whereas I could just say, hey, look at this picture that's next to it. You know, look at the arrow and change it to like 
become something like that. So kind of it's like a very, very like ghetto way to do it. But I think it does the trick because you just look at this one picture, you immediately know which parts you need to change and kind of where to draw your inspiration from. So uh, basically what happened after that was that uh, they then came back to me with like a draft mock on a piece of paper. And then kind of you have like a revision one, like kind of like the Iron Man suit here, like the very ghetto first one. And then you just keep changing it as you go along. And so revision wise, um, so just reaching out, doing due diligence, it took me like a week. But to get the final design in run for the sample took probably two weeks, I guess, just going all the back and forth. And you know, I think what happens is when you get the sample, you want to sit on it for like a day or two. Uh, before you go back to the supplier because you want to sit on these design things before you jump into it. So kind of that's why I took my time a little longer there. But as far as like actually reaching out and finding what it was like literally less than a week. So yeah, and then after that, uh, the sample, uh, you pay it through one of the platforms on Alibaba called AliExpress. It's basically a place where suppliers can post their products at wholesale. So think of it as Amazon before suppliers where you can actually buy their samples there for them. And then that's how you pay them. And then that's uh, how I got shipped kind of in a nutshell. Okay, cool. So in the two weeks that you had a back and forth, what were some of the things that you talked about with the manufacturer? Sure. So one thing uh, the supplier did was I I wanted to add like an extra pocket on one of the flaps, and then the su- supplier was like, "Hey, you know, I don't think this will look good. You know, here's what we think." And we had some back and forth, just like a very like cordial back and forth. They were saying why they didn't do this, and I was like, "Okay, so you know, why why do you think we shouldn't do this?" And then they're saying, "Oh, you know, because you know it'll." It wouldn't flow with the design well and, you know, kind of some objections. But I was like, hey, you know, I just want to try this. You know, let's just do it. If it sucks, hey, it's on me. So I, I kind of just uh, forced it through. And so uh, what was interesting was that during this process, I realized that their designers used to work for a Japanese uh, leather company. They wouldn't tell me which one, but basically they used to make high-end stuff in Japan. So that kind of told me that, hey, okay, they actually know what they're talking about. But, you know, I- I'm the customer in the end, so I'll, I'll do what I want. So something just came to mind and I forgot to ask, like initially when you initiated this conversation with the factory, were they like, oh, we only deal with, you know, minimum order quantities of like 500 or something like that. And how, how did you approach that side of the conversation? Sure. So Alibaba, every supplier, I forgot to mention this, they actually say uh, MLQ, which is minimum order quantity, which is basically saying, hey, you know, if you want to buy from us, you need to buy this amount. So if you're buying shoelaces, it'll be in yards, right? You need to buy like 5,000 yards of shoelaces on your first run, which, you know, it's, I guess in the manufacturing world, it's pretty normal. But when you're just getting into it, you're like, whoa, like I need to buy this mass quantity. What am I going to do with it? And so uh, what I did was my supplier I found they were all they also had a low MOQ. I think their minimum was like 30 units and they let me get by with just 20 in the end when I actually ordered it. So so basically when you look for a supplier, you know, I think MOQ is just a benchmark. They're pretty flexible. I think they can be pretty flexible with it depending on their capacity, I guess. Like if they have nothing to do, like if they're, you know, it's kind of like a slow season for them, maybe they'll be more lax, but if they're really busy, they probably won't care about you. And I think the important thing is to just be upfront saying like, hey, you know, I'm just starting out. Uh, you know, I don't want to promise you, you know, 10,000 orders and only come in with 2,000. Because I think that's what a lot of people do when they first get in the game. They, they try to promise like, you know, all these orders that we're going to buy all this product and then you don't come through. And I think for the relationship to develop, it, it's really bad to start off on the wrong foot that way. Whereas, you know, if you just start out small and you kind of build as you go along, it kind of makes more sense just uh, from my view. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so you were able to get the initial design of it done and you're ready to go into product sample. At what point did you discuss the pricing part of the uh, equation? Sure. So they they actually tell you the sample price on Alibaba, I think, depending on the supplier. But basically, um, I just asked them, hey, you know, how much does the sample cost? And I think what some people do is they actually charge you almost a retail price for the sample or somewhat a little bit higher than the MLQ price. And what happens is that when you then when you order an actual batch, uh, whatever amount that is, they actually refund you half the price of the sample just so that you don't just get a sample at like super, super wholesale and then you disappear because they wasted their time and energy on it. So I think this first sample, um, if it's like cloth, garments, you know, some stuff, they might send it to you for free. Like I've gotten some like buttons or elastic band sample and they all sent it for free. But I think like for an actual sample sample product, um, that's kind of that has more labor intensive, uh, you would probably expect to pay uh, some amount of money for it too. And so this goes into the product that you choose too, because if you're making like razors or I don't know, like automobile parts, I mean, there's no way you could 
really expect like a reasonable sample price or for them to send it to you for free. Where it's kind of like a small leather accessory like this. Hey, you just pay them maybe the material cost, some little bit of overhead, and then uh, you get a sample good to go. So I think a lot of this ties into your niche selection too in terms of the product. You know, is it pretty easy to manufacture? Is it pretty relatively low tech? Or in terms of like the intensity, you don't really have a lot of moving parts to just get a sample made and then that you can then test the idea with. Cool. So you paid for the sample and then they just shipped it to you. And what next? Sure. So when you pay for the sample, uh, one thing that I need to flag on is that on AliExpress, you need to enter your, uh, you need to give them a copy of the bank ATM card, uh, your passport, and also a statement of the bank account it's tied to just because they don't want people randomly finding credit cards and then buying like 10,000 orders of slippers. And I think one, it also protects the buyer yourself just in case someone does, you know, steal your credit card information and suddenly you have an order of like, you know, 10,000 fans or something like that. I mean, I mean, it sounds scary at first, but I think it's actually great that they're protecting people uh, this way. And so what happens is uh, AliExpress is kind of like an escrow system too. So you pay the money first, but uh, they don't actually get it until they enter the tracking number for the shipment. So they actually need to say, hey, you know, we both agree on a certain timetable to send the product. And then if they don't send it, you know, if they don't come back and say, hey, we sent this product to you within, I think, like 30 days or 40 days, uh, AliExpress actually cancels the money and they refund you back, I believe. So uh, there's kind of a both side escrow. And then uh, after you decide on the shipment date, you know, they'll enter the tracking number and then they'll release the money and then you can track where your goods are. Uh, and then take things from there. And did the sample turn out to be pretty much what you expected based on your communications? Yeah, I mean, the product is relatively simple, really straightforward design. Uh, it's just that I knew I wanted to make some changes eventually into like a future more advanced prototype. Uh, kind of like there's like identity protection, you know, RFID blocking and like kind of adding different buttons and the like add-ons on there. So, I mean, I knew that was going to come later, but just to get the sample on hand first... Uh, that's something I wanted to do. And so what I did after that was that, okay, so you get the sample on hand, you know, I spent like 30, 40 bucks to get this made, you know, not, not, not like ground cheap, but it's, you know, a small amount of money to test it. So I think the next step I want to do with it, okay, so before I make this batch of product, how can I actually verify this further? And so what I did was, uh, I basically wrote up kind of like a feature page, sales page, and then I posted it within, uh, the Dynamite Circle forums, which is the private forums that we're part of, just to see, okay, would anyone want to pre-order this, you know, before I make it, and just to test out kind of the value proposition and see what the initial feedback was. And so, really, all I did was I took a bunch of photos with my iPhone 4 camera on, you know, HDR mode, and then uh, you kind of use it yourself. I, you know, the power of demonstration. I actually put my passports in it, and uh, my ticket, you know, my bank cards, uh, currency in it, just to show people, hey, you know, this is not something, you know, I'm stealing photos on. It's actually something I have uh, in my house. And that, what I also did was I actually did a video too of me showing, you know, people the product, how it looks like with everything in it. And so that's something I slapped together. And then, you know, at the end, you can say, hey, you can buy this for uh, a certain price and, you know, I'll get this made. It'll take like four weeks to make and then I'll ship it to you in uh, early July. And then, yeah, and then the minimum order uh, was 30 units, right? And so the supplier was willing to cut me some slack and then go with 20. And so basically I pre-sold 22 and then uh, that's how it went. And so I had the money up front to send to the supplier and to get the first batch made without really uh, investing more of my money into the whole project. So I think that was kind of the initial test. And, you know, with I think it's one thing to have like three people buy from you that you know, but I think 20 is a pretty good number that... It probably has legs on its own. And maybe uh, the real test would be to be selling this to people like you and me don't know, completely random strangers. But I think just as a base to work off of, it's it's a pretty good start. It's uh, definitely a smart way to go about it to test the demand before you actually even make it. Based on what you said, everything sounds like it went pretty smoothly. Yeah, and I think one thing one thing to add, I think what's the e-commerce average conversion rate? I think it's like 2 to 3%. So... Uh, if you look at the forums we're part of, I think there's like, at the time I posted, there's probably like 500 people. And, you know, when you look at 22 orders, it's kind of like a 3% conversion rate. So I guess that's something to kind of like guesstimate too, I think when you're testing out. So I actually just saw this yesterday. I was wondering what this conversion rate was. So, yeah. Well, it was a pretty targeted audience too, right? It's a bunch of people who travel a lot and uh, really like the location independent lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. And I think one thing to add on the branding side, I didn't mention is that the product, uh, one thing we always say in the forums is Bala, right? Like 
like B-A-L-A, when someone does something awesome, you know, they land a new client, uh, you know, they, they made new revenue targets. We're like, Bala, that's awesome, man. So happy for you. And so I took that word and I used that as the branding for this word because I think, uh, A, there's an emotional tie to this word with people in this community. And I think it's a different angle that differentiates it from some random, you know, leather wallet that's on the market. So uh, I think, and then I think the process for that is when you think about it, it's like, okay, so, you know, who is this product for? Kind of like the demographic, you know, whoever your customer is, you know, what kind of, what's an experience that bonds them well? I think an example was uh, a business I interviewed uh, by Ezra Firestone called Boom by Cindy Joseph. And so they make organic skincare products for women that are in their, you know, late 50s or early 50s. You know, they're becoming older and uh, kind of like the most cosmetics are marketed towards younger women, right? But they're actually saying, no, you know, we're just going to focus on this demographic. You know, we know what they're going through. You know, they're aging, all this stuff. And then kind of their messaging was built around that and it resonated very well. And I think if you look at kind of Ezra's business, Boom by City Joseph, and kind of uh, my little product here, I mean, both products serve a certain community in, in the sense that they're shared they're sharing this experience that resonates very well within the audience. And I think that's kind of what drove a lot of people to pre-buy this. And just from the excitement in like five, four or five people, they're like really excited to get this. And I get messages saying, like, oh, I can't wait to get this. And it's awesome that, you know, you're using the word Bala on it because, you know, it's such a cool word. And it's it's like <laughs> it's like very modern because I have a hashtag on it, too. And I think the hashtag is for something that's someone that's very, you know, social media, new age savvy, whereas kind of if you look at, like the different brands out there, like, you know, like Louis Vuitton, you know, Ferragamo, they're kind of like uptight or not really uptight. They're just kind of like the old school fashion brands that have their luxury status. So whereas this is kind of like a cool new image thing. And, you know, and maybe this is not the wrong way to go, but it's kind of like a process that I'm still trying to figure out. So and that's what also makes it exciting. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I was saying like, so it sounds like the whole process went pretty smoothly for you. You didn't run into any particular obstacles you know like no one scammed you out of a ton of money in china which happens more often than people would like like to you know admit so why do you think that was the case or you know where along the way do you think there could have been some some sort of dangerous spots or mistakes that could have been made sure i think one thing it just comes down to your due diligence and gut feeling it's like with this supplier you know i would just call the salesperson randomly and just chat and they were like a real person right and so i think where as a scammer they would probably be not as willing or i guess they would be more have stuff to hide and it's for them you know anytime i ask them a question like hey you know uh, where your designers come from you know what's your best-selling product you know, what other clients do you have? And you know, do you have a reference or, you know, uh, stuff like this. They're all very straightforward. And I think just after time, you know, it became a pretty solid relationship. And in the sense that, you know, although I wasn't really buying customer yet, but they were still willing to be this helpful. Uh, I just took a leap of faith that, hey, you know, maybe this is a good supplier. And, and they've been great to me uh, so far, too. Now, as for horror stories, hey, maybe I'll run into one down the road. But I think uh, now, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to find a, Good one, too. And I think, you know, for anyone who's looking into this game, you know, take your time to find a good supplier. I think don't just, you know, has, you can spend some time to exchange, like, say, four or five emails and then just say, hey, can I give you a call? Just I have a few more questions. You know, we've been emailing a couple of times. Let's just nail some things out over the phone. It's a lot quicker. And just to see how they respond to that, right? Because I think most people who are pretty normal in a B2B setting, you know, that's it's a fairly normal thing to have a salesperson, you know, you have an email conversation and you escalate it into a phone conversation. And then maybe at some point, you know, you actually visit China. And so, uh, yeah, it's kind of leap of faith. And I think in the end, really, it depends on what product you're making. Too. Like, you can't make an iPhone product, technology product, just over email. Too. You actually need to go there and like work the designs and stuff like that. Too. So I think a lot of it maybe was just because the product I made is fairly low tech in the sense that, you know, it really just it designs right on paper. Generally, it should come out fine uh, on the end product, which is kind of a nice thing, too, because it's kind of I like proactively made this choice to make something like this, too. So. Right. And you also speak Chinese. I know that because, you know, you're from Taiwan. And did that play a role at all in the communications or are you able to get by pretty much by English? Yeah. So the first outreach I did, I actually, did, I forgot to mention this. Yeah, I speak Mandarin. I lived in Asia like 15 years. So it's fairly fluent in Mandarin. So basically my first outreach, I just typed it all in Mandarin. And then I actually translated into Google uh uh, simplified Chinese just so it would be easier for them to read just to say that hey you know I'm 
you know, not some random guy who's sending you random requests in English. So I think that comes off. It makes you comes off as a little bit different than your average person just inquiring about supplies. And then I think it shows them that, hey, you're serious about working with us. You know, you're not just spamming a lot of requests. Because I think Alibaba, when you request suppliers, they can actually reject you. And they can actually put you on a blacklist. I think if you're too spammy or maybe you're not good to work with uh, on Alibaba. So they don't just protect the buyers. They also protect the uh, marketplace sellers too. So uh, I got what, initial email was an email is in Mandarin. And then they replied back in Mandarin. And after that, I was like, okay, this is too hard. Let's just talk in English. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then by then, it was a, the, she already knew that you know, if there was a problem that couldn't be explained in email, we could just talk on the phone. And then throughout the sampling process, I called them like once or twice just to make sure uh, this design was what I wanted. And also just before I ordered the sample that, hey, we ran through everything. You reconfirm all the details before you get them made. Because I think it's one thing to look at a design and to say, hey, that's okay. Versus saying, hey, you know, I want to make sure this pocket is uh, 10 centimeters as we agreed because you know if you look at a design that's a rectangle you never know how big the rectangle is right i mean it's just a rectangle so you need to reconfirm everything before you get stuff made uh, either on the sampling process or before you actually get the order made and so i think uh, don't assume the supplier always knows what you're thinking or don't always assume they know what you're thinking but you should actually be proactive to just to make sure that you both are on the same page because you know if you assume they know what you're thinking and the stuff comes out wrong it really is still on you in the end because i mean the product is at your side and it just wastes your time you need to go do revisions you know you have like you, know, you yell at them or I don't, I don't know what you do but basically the more you can proactively prevent this stuff the easier it is uh, down the line so yeah reconfirm everything that's like definitely probably like the biggest tip i would give actually <laughs> yeah that's a great Great piece of advice because you know having lived in China for a couple months now you know the best assumption is to assume that something is going to go wrong be one step ahead and think of the possibilities of what could go wrong and just be one step ahead of that yeah and I think there's a cultural thing too where if you tell a supplier can you do this they'll say yes but in the sense that maybe they'll try to figure it out later but they don't want to like say hey I don't know how to do it uh, I don't know, how, how do I explain this like, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, they'll say yes, but then... Yeah, it, it's not like a yes, like in Western society. Like, yes, I completely understand what you're doing. It's more like a, okay, yeah, I think I know what you're doing. But if I don't, I don't want to make you look bad. Like, I, like I'm an idiot or something like that, too. So, uh, uh-huh. I guess it's kind of hard to explain. But I would say just to get over this, you just reconfirm everything. And you just say, hey, you know, if anything is not clear, uh, let me know. You kind of give them the opportunity to say, hey, you know, if you don't know this and that, you know, don't just run away and pretend you know it. Actually, tell me uh, what's wrong. And I think if you proactively do that, they'll be much more comfortable saying, hey, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. And then it opens the dialogue uh, much easier up front, I think. Cool. Yeah. So now you've got the first production run of your passport wallet and you're ready to send them out, right? Yep, uh, they just got here as a time we're recording on uh, early July. They just got here uh, two days ago. So it took about almost a month to manufacture. And so I think what happened during that time was they had to like uh, buy a new linen, like a new part component of the product was like out of supply. So they had to wait like a week, but I mean, it was like a ma- minor hiccup. So I think uh, the next step is to, you know, get these fulfilled, shipped out, uh, you know, and keep everyone happy. So, but I think that's for another podcast. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, thanks very much for sharing the whole process with us. And I mean, it's great to hear that you're you're not like some sourcing expert who's lived in Shenzhen for like a decade and knows the ins and outs, but you were able to, using your common sense and a little bit of street smarts, get a product from scratch, you know, yeah, sourced exactly. from a manufacturer in China. So that's pretty that's pretty cool and very inspiring. Right? Yeah, and the cool thing is that, you know, it's it's profitable already. I mean, with the twenty units, you know, I was actually able to buy thirty of inventory and then with that still have some money left too to work on some other marketing stuff. So Hashtag Bala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with that I think we're gonna wrap up this interview. Before we do that, though, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're currently excited about and focusing on? 
Sure. So the next step is to get this website up for the store. Like, I actually don't even have a store yet for this product, and I'm profit already, which is kind of a good place to be in. And so uh, the next thing is to get this place all ramped up. Uh, what I did earlier is I did a, a kind of mind map of all the pages I need on the store and just get this online. And then uh, next will be to test this on Amazon and eBay alongside other products and see how they do. Uh, kind of a different price points too because right now i'm selling it at a pretty low one just to family and friends within the dynamite circle so i think different price points uh value propositions is kind of what's exciting me next and also uh just you know getting these products put in the cardboard boxes you know looking for boxes bubble wraps and getting them shipped is like it's like the most exciting thing ever because usually when you go shopping you're spending money right but this you're shopping for boxes that you're going to turn into more money which i think makes it even more exciting when you're doing this procurement side I think too. So that's what's exciting me now is getting these shipped out and then uh, taking this to the next level on an actual store and platform and to see where this goes. And also, I think just to share as a case study back with the audience on buildmyonlinestore.com. Uh, so part one was how I got this made, kind of what we talked about uh, today, but in more detail in terms of what I actually did, there's some screenshots, uh, kind of like the SEO stuff. I go into that a little bit and kind of the mindset issues. And then the next will be saying, you know, how I got these fulfilled, uh, the pre-sale process and ramping up the stores. So uh, definitely stay tuned for that on the website. Cool. Yeah, we'll link up to that in the show notes as well. I saw the first post that you did about the case study for this. And yeah, it was really good. Final message for the audience and let them know how they can connect with you online. Sure, uh, you guys can find me at buildmyonlinestore.com. And I think if you want to get into manufacturing, uh, it's not as scary as it sounds. I mean, I got started with under 100 bucks, uh, depending on the product you want to choose. It's certainly a lot more transparent than, say, 10, 15 years ago, where just even finding suppliers, you really had to kind of be on the ground in China, or you had to know some people who knew some people. And now the process is a lot more transparent although a lot more is on you as the entrepreneur to do your due diligence and kind of get the heavy lifting connecting all the dots together but i think it's a lot more easier and really it's a lot more fun because i think once you realize that you can create something in the world and then people will pay you for it you know just not out of thin air but it's something you had an idea from you execute on it and it becomes a product and then it translates into money i think your paradigm becomes a lot different uh, whereas i think kind of if you're just drop shipping uh, in some different models it's a little easier but i think there's a certain fulfillment that's uh, not there but uh, certainly that's just my view you know everyone might be different but i think uh, if you're thinking about it uh, definitely try it out just give yourself a small budget and you know go find suppliers and then just jump into it so that's my word of advice and if you want to find out more about uh kind of learning from different e-commerce entrepreneurs like JP or other guests I've had that are, you know, either doing anywhere from 100K to 5 million a year, uh, check out buildmyonlinestore.com and you can hear from their stories, lessons, and mistakes. Cool. Thanks very much for being on the show, Terry. Awesome. Thanks for having me, JP. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of China Business Cast. I want to hear your feedback and suggestions for the show. What topics do you want to hear about? Who should I get on the show? Go to ChinaBusinessCast.com and give me your input. Thanks for listening.